As a powerlifter, we all know that volume is one of the big rocks in training. It is a simple enough concept that we hear all the time, but here's something that you probably don't know. When we say volume, not everyone is conceptualizing the same thing. Are you talking about total reps, rep range, total sets, or even tonnage? Wait, what's tonnage? Wait till the end of the video so you find out. So in this video, I will be breaking down everything that you need to understand with what volume is conceptually, how to find your optimal volume and how other factors influence volume so that you have a solid framework to use whether you coach other lifters or write your own programs. And if you stay to the end, I will go through some myths, misconceptions and killer resources that have helped me with my thinking with volume. So without any further ado, let us begin. So first things first, we need to define what we mean by volume in the context of strength or powerlifting training. I don't even know what that means. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. No, it's not. It's it gets gross. the people it, going. It, it, now, volume can refer to various things depending on who you're speaking to. Now, volume can be a very general term, meaning how much work someone is doing, and it can be measured by various specific metrics. Confusingly, these metrics are all interconnected strongly. So when people use the word volume, they can refer to the following total reps, which is the overall number of reps that you do for a certain movement category or muscle group. It can mean total sets, which is the total number of hard sets that you do for a movement or muscle. Quite often, people only include hard sets within a certain proximity to failure. It can mean tonnage, which is sets times reps times weight which is a metric of how much work that you have done. And it can also mean rep range. This is a definition that's used less commonly. Sometimes when people say high volume, they mean higher reps, but all of these four metrics are linked. For example, if you increase the total reps or sets with everything else being constant, you will inevitably increase tonnage. But for the purpose of this video, I will be focusing on mainly two of these metrics, which are total reps and total sets, but I will sometimes refer back to tonnage. The reason why one metric is not enough is because it helps build a more accurate picture. For example, if you do two sets of 10, the total sets is two and the total reps is 20. But if you spread the total reps across more sets, for example, four sets, you can get four sets of five, which is twice the number of sets, but the total reps is the same, assuming that you keep the absolute intensity the same. So those are some of the metrics of volume. But what is volume conceptually speaking? So volume conceptually is a tool or training variable that can be manipulated by the coach or athlete. In a training program, volume in terms of reps and sets is a means to distribute work at specific training intensities. Volume can also be conceptualized as part of a training dose. And if volume forms part of training dose, then there is something called a dose response relationship to training. A dose response relationship refers to the relationship between the dose of the exposure and the response or outcome that it produces. So in the context of strength training, the dose can refer to the volume and intensity of training, which are quantitative variables, as well as exercise selection, which is a more qualitative variable. And the response can refer to the changes in muscle hypertrophy, strength, or performance in powerlifting. So the relationship between volume and intensity is complex and can vary depending on multiple factors. And generally speaking, there is an inverse relationship between volume and intensity. An inverse relationship basically means that as one variable increases, the other decreases. So for example, if you lift at higher intensities, the amount of volume that you can do is less. Now that we understand what volume is, why is it important for powerlifting? Now, training volume is going to be a dial that we constantly need to monitor and manage as a means of implementing the core principles. So the core principles that I'm referring to are going to be progressive overload, specificity, fatigue management, and individuality. The physical condition an athlete is in is going to be in a constant state of flux and uncertainty, which is why cookie cutter programs are often inadequate for a lot of people. And if a cookie cutter program is enough now, it will eventually be inadequate later on as the state of the athlete changes. So we manage volume among many other variables to drive qualities that are important in powerlifting, namely gains in muscle hypertrophy, muscular strength, and ultimately performance in the power lifts. So when we apply progressive overload, over time, volume can increase, but past a certain point, the effectiveness of that volume will give diminishing returns and be harmful. And this gives rise to the dose response curve. What this essentially means is that there is a Goldilocks range for volume or a sweet spot. And your goal is to try and find what that range is as accurately as possible. So why does the dose response relationship matter for volume? So we understand that there is a dose response relationship for training of which volume is a huge contributor of. And this dose response relationship appears as a curve that we see here. And thanks to Dr. Mike Isretel, credit where credit is due, we have some really useful concepts for these volume landmarks that can be useful in the context of finding 
the optimal dose of volume. So these landmarks are going to be maintenance volume, minimum effective volume, maximal adaptive volume, and maximal recoverable volume. These concepts are initially used to describe concepts in hypertrophy training, but I think it has equal validity towards strength training as well. So when describing volume with these terms, we normally refer to the number of hard sets. So what do these concepts mean and why does it matter? So MV or maintenance volume refers to the amount of volume needed to maintain the level of adaptation for the athlete. So in powerlifting, it would be strength. Minimum volume can be conceptualized as a singular point on a curve. So the next one, we have MEV or minimum effective volume, which refers to the minimum volume needed for any new adaptations to be made for the athlete. So MEV can be visualized as a range that is higher than the maintenance volume. So the next one, we have MAV or maximal adaptive volume, which refers to the level of volume needed to stimulate the most amount of new adaptations. Now, this is the holy grail for a lifter's program, and we can call this range the optimal dose. Now, the MAV can be seen as the range that encompasses the peak of that dose response curve. And then the next one that we have is MRV, which is the maximal recoverable volume, which refers to the most amount of volume that you can do while being able to recover from it. So the excess volume difference between MRV and MAV is causing diminishing returns where the new adaptations made are less than when training with MAV. At the far end of the MRV is the amount that you can do where you are just able to recover back to baseline. And so the difference in volume between the MRV and the MAV can be referred to as junk volume. Pasture MRV is the dose of training that you are not able to recover from and your performance trend will go down after this. This is considered the level of volume where risk of overuse injuries will skyrocket and overreaching occurs. At this point, this is when deloads and tapers are going to be a necessary tool for programming. So one important thing that you need to remember is that these landmarks are not necessarily something that you need to predetermine in order to program, but a useful way of retrospectively judging where past training is on where they lie on the curve. At least it's not for a human being to predetermine, but maybe for an AI to figure out in the future. Another important programming consideration is that your goal is not to always find your MAV week in, week out throughout the whole year. If you consider the psychological factors for lifting, there are going to be times of the year where you may need to bring yourself more towards your maintenance volume or even your minimum effective volume to prevent burnouts. Sometimes you may even find yourself below the maintenance volume threshold, which will lead to a loss of adaptations, i.e. losing strength. Now, this may obviously be due to things out of, outside of lifting, such as going on holidays or illnesses, but that's okay, that's part of life. And that's going to be an inevitable part of having powerlifting as a hobby. So what does research actually say about volume? Whenever I teach anyone about volume, I often refer back to a research paper. So the paper I often cite is titled The Applications of the Dose Response for Muscular Strength Development, a review of meta-analytic efficacy and reliability for designing training prescription by Peterson, Rear and Alva in 2005 from the Journal on Strength and Conditioning Science. So what this paper does is it explores the dose response in resistance training for the purpose of maximal strength development. So I do recognize that at the time of making this paper, this is somewhat of an older paper, but the benefit from this paper are the two graphs here, which I believe illustrates the idea of a dose response relationship with volume and its relative changes from people with different training ages. And what they show is that there is a bell curve which demonstrates the dose response and the existence of a sweet spot or an optimal range. And what you also see is the difference in the height of the bell curve between untrained, trained and athlete populations. As you can see, People who are new to strength training will often have faster rates of gains, but their optimal dose of volume in this case is much lower than, let's say, more experienced individuals who need more volume. And this shows the idea of progressive overload that over time, as you become more trained, the size of the dose needed to continue to bring about more gains increases. So here's another graph that illustrates the theoretical relationship of the size of the gains with different populations and the volume needed to bring about optimal gains for them. It's also worth noting that the sweet spot for individuals is going to vary on factors like lifestyle and genetics as well. So these graphs look at training age, but when it comes to biological age, I've yet to come across any research looking into this, but we can deduce that as we age, our work capacity will likely go down as we hit our mid thirties and all the way to our elderly years. This is due to our physiology inevitably causing sarcopenia, a condition that affects older adults and is characterized by the gradual loss of muscle mass and strength and function over time. So it is an age-related and involuntary loss of skeletal muscle mass and strength that can begin as early as the fourth decade of life. Another consideration that's also worth taking into account is that there is likely going to be a difference between what's an optimal level of volume for maximal strength and optimal level of volume for optimal hypertrophy gains. And strength and hypertrophy 
photography are both important qualities for building a good powerlifter. And also there may well possibly be a difference in what optimal volume is between exercises as well. So what is ideal volume influenced by? So now that we understand that there is a dose response relationship and at any given time, there's an optimal range of volumes that would be ideal for you. And this optimal range is in this constant state of flux. There are some factors which do not necessarily make a considerable shift in this range, but there are some factors which will make a huge shift. So we can easily categorize these factors in terms of our ability to predict them, measure them, know them, and even control them. It's also worth considering how much impact each of these factors are. Important factors that you should consider are going to include things like sex and genetics, energy balance and diet quality, external stresses, training experience, sleep, psychological aspects, social and work life, other physical activity, and injury and health status. Here is a table that demonstrates how these factors may include the level of volume that you can do. Feel free to pause and have a look at this table to see how I rated these factors and their impact on optimizing training volume. So how to find the optimal range of volume? Now that we understand the nature of volume, we are in a position to attempt to find ourselves the holy grail of the optimal range. Now there are some good news here and some bad news here. Now the good news is, is that we can develop a framework that provides us a system of processes that can lead us to figuring out where an optimal range of volume may lie. And the bad news is, is that you'll never truly know exactly where the optimal level of volume is. And there is probably going to be an indefinite combination of exercises, intensity and volumes that you could actually develop good progress from. So if you really think about it, that means that there's going to be a lot of viable potential programs that you could do. In the real world, consistency with a good enough program is going to be the best that we get. Even if we do find the optimal level of volume, it doesn't necessarily stay optimal forever. And in my opinion, this is why a good coach will not necessarily provide you with the perfect programming from day one, but a good coach will be one who has a solid framework that can manage the dose that will move you ever closer towards the quote unquote ideal level of volume. Now, how you are going to find the optimal ranges of volume is going to depend massively on who the athlete is that the program is for. Now we're going to split this process up into untrained and trained individuals, i.e. beginners or experienced lifters. Now for the ease of establishing volume, we are going to talk about this in terms of sets, specifically hard sets. Now with an untrained lifter, the minimum effective volume is going to be extremely low because going from doing nothing to doing something is already going to implement overload. My suggestion as a starting point is going to start from anywhere between five to 12 sets for each muscle group or movement. Now in the context of lower body movements, namely the squat and the deadlift, as they use similar muscle groups, they may look like six sets of squats and six sets of deadlifts, or even eight sets of squats and four sets of deadlifts, depending on your situation and philosophy. Also note that I am referring to weekly sets. Now, as there are many nuances and variables to programming, as an untrained beginner who is unlikely to have hard training sets where they are training with a distant proximity to failure, you may have more sets through the week. Now let's move on to the process of figuring out the optimal volume for a trained individual. So for trained individuals, they have something that untrained individuals do not have, which is training history. Now, if the lifter has data or copies of previous training, for example, from previous coaches or cookie cutter programs, then that will make your life much easier. Now, if the lifter has not got anything written down because they were freestyling it, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult to figure out from the start. And so what you need to do is ask for their anecdotes regarding what level of volume they, they were used to and figure out when they were making the most gains. Now, if the lifter was hopping from one cookie cutter program to another cookie cutter program, then you need to establish which programs they made the most gains from regarding each of the lift. And what you need to do is work out the following calculations, the total weekly reps, and the total weekly sets for each of the main lifts and for the muscle groups as well. If the program has high volume and low volume phases in it, then you need to find the range of the week with the highest and lowest total reps and sets. And then you want to be able to average them out. And now you have the profiles of the nature of each of these programs. And a wise saying goes, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. And this is very true when it comes to finding your optimal level of volume. So use these metrics as a basis to building up your training week for that lifter. A useful tip that you may want to also consider is that you may want to put more emphasis and relevance for more recent training than from past training from a year ago or even five plus years ago. Also note, yes, you can analyze a program to a deeper level, but for the purpose of volume, these metrics are going to be a good starting point. And if you find that the lifter has plateaued, then you may need to look into the program deeper to see whether the lifter has gotten the dose wrong in terms of intensity as well. So how to manipulate volume over time. So once we establish where we 
we think our volume should be, it's important to consider how we manipulate volume in training throughout the year. A key thing to remember, even though we are talking about volume in this video, volume is one of the many possible ways of managing the stimulus in training. And there is time and place to manipulate volume and there's a time and place to manipulate other variables. So remember, if you are going to manipulate volume, you are going to have to consider what that does in terms of what absolute intensity and percentage you are going to be able to perform at those levels of volume. Because remember, volume and intensity have an inverse relationship. So long term, I do think that from a beginner to an elite lifter, you do build up work capacity in terms of total reps that you need and can perform. So volume can really increase over time. So short term, when it comes to a matter of months, I don't think that the amount of volume that a lifter should be training with should vary that drastically. Even if there are someone who uses block periodization where you bias more volume in certain blocks and intensity in other blocks. If you are going to increase the volume through total reps or total sets, you can drastically increase the tonnage and therefore the stimulus, which can often lead to drastic peaks and troughs in weekly performance. I do think that good places where you do change volume more substantially may be at the ends of blocks where you have an introduction week or a deload week at the end, whether they are more proactive or reactive deloads. This doesn't mean that you can't have small adjustments in volume through the weeks as you are making more micro adjustments to the training dose. And a good rule of thumb is changing levels of volume within the 10% range. You can also swap the levels of volume between exercises as well to adjust the emphasis on slightly different goals from one training block to another. So for example, in one training block, you may want to do three sets on the squats and five sets on the leg press. And in a later block, you may want to move that to four sets of squats and four sets on a leg press. And what this essentially does is basically increase the specificity in training. When manipulating volume in a powerlifting program, it's useful to know the impact of volume and intensity of additional accessory exercises and primary movements. Now, there is no black and white easy way to judge how, let's say, four sets on a leg press affects squats versus four sets on a leg extension affects squats. But it's worth using observation and intuition to judge the impact of that as well. So those are considerations that you may want to make when you're manipulating volume primarily. But you do also want to consider what you may need to do as a consequence of manipulating other factors as well, including when you are primarily attempting to adjust training frequency or even intensity. So let's explore some of the potential pitfalls and misconceptions of volume. The first myth is strong lifters need high volume. So this is a huge misconception that stronger lifters needs high level of volume in order to try and optimize the gains. Genetics and lifestyle play a huge factor into what is considered optimal for a lifter. And I have come across so many strong and high level lifters where their levels of volumes are even similar to those who are relative beginners. So the second myth is that if performance is going down, then volume needs to go up. Nope, not necessarily true you may well easily be on the overreaching side of the bell curve of the dose response relationship. If your performance is going down because you are not able to recover from it, adding more volume is just going to increase your risk of injury. So number three is over-reliant on general volume recommendations. So using guidelines recommended by research or textbooks are a sensible place to start, but they should not be the expectation. Now, remember that research is often based on populations and averages, and not everyone necessarily falls within the range of the average. And there is a huge range in what people can respond well to in terms of volume and intensity. Number four, more is always better. Most coaches don't actually think this, but there are new lifters that deep down probably know that more is not always better, but the temptation is strong to push for higher levels of volume in training, pun not intended. Some lifters have the sense that being the best at outworking everyone is the way to go. The truth is anyone can make an athlete tired, but if it is not at a level that allows you to be able to first recover and secondly create new adaptations, then the fact is, is that the volume is way too much. Number five, peak and tapers should always have lower levels of volume. So my opinion is, is that back in the day, lifters used to train purposefully to overreach where your performance would deliberately go down. So that having a peak and taper where there are harsher tapers in volume allowed all of that excess fatigue to dissipate in the hopes of super compensating. What is more common practice nowadays is holding the training dose at a level where week after week, you are still able to perform at a similar stimulus plus more. Therefore, most of the volume that is being performed is not necessarily creating any excess fatigue, which is why nowadays people often opt for a more conservative taper or even have a no taper peak. And this is also often done in the hopes of more predictability for attempt selections too. So those are the five myths that I think are worth remembering. Now, as promised, here are a couple resources that I have found to be very useful for my understanding as a coach. So the first one is going to be the Stronger by Science website. So on this website, particularly this page that I've linked down in the description below, has a great list of meta-analysis and systematic review papers, as well as other blog articles discussing the actual research. So if you don't know what a meta-analysis and systematic review paper is, they are basically research papers to look 
look at and combine findings from previous research together to formulate a stronger conclusion for a given topic. Now, they can be a good place to start when it comes to establishing guidelines for things like training volume and intensity and proximity to failure. And it can really help inform your programming when it comes to taking on a lifter. And the second resource that I really recommend is the Data Driven Strength Podcast. So I don't always listen to podcasts, but in terms of the powerlifting world, this is probably one of my favorite podcasts that I like to learn from. They make really meaningful and understandable discussions about powerlifting programming and also delve into some of the latest research and findings and give their take on it. Definitely check them out. They have a ton of useful episodes on it. I've just put a link to their podcast below, so go check them out. If you want to learn more, go check out this video in this corner here. If you want to see more useful stuff on programming, comment on what you want to see in the future in the box below. Otherwise, click like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so I don't miss you guys on the next one.